Welcome to today's sponsored episode of Machine Learning Street Talk. I'm your host, Tim Scarf, and today we explore one of the most radical frontiers of technology and humanity, the digitization of the human mind. My guest is Dmitry Shapiro, CEO of UAI, a company building tools to understand the mind. Dmitry believes that digitizing our mental experiences and insights could unlock tremendous benefits, but mapping the human psyche also raises deep questions. In this conversation, we grapple with mind digitization's possibilities and perils, and how it will transform learning, relationships, even our sense of identity. What risks will we face by rendering our inner lives as data? And can we develop this technology responsibly while upholding human dignity. The interplay of topics we discuss is complex but compelling. We explore how digitizing the mind could enhance empathy and connection between people, yet also threaten privacy. It may improve education and mental health, but risks exacerbating inequality if misapplied. Most profoundly, mind digitization forces us to ask what it means to be human in an age where technology mediates our understanding of ourselves and others. Will we risk losing something intangible as we render the psyche in bits and algorithms, or gain a new means of flourishing by optimizing our cognition and relationships? There are no easy answers, but Dimitri offers a vision balanced by hard thinking about the challenges ahead. His perspective provides a glimpse into a future that can unsettle us or fulfill our hopes. What if you had a digital assistant which truly knew you, one which understands how you think, what you know, your strengths, weaknesses, aptitudes, interests, and values? An AI that can enhance your life in profound ways by augmenting your weaknesses, amplifying your strengths, and connecting you with like-minded people. That is the vision of UAI. UAI is an app which allows you to build a personalized AI assistant by engaging with interactive prompts and questions. As you share details about yourself, UAI builds a rich multi-dimensional model of your mind. It captures not just what you do, but how you think. With UAI, you get a personalized feed of prompts tailored to you, answer questions about your preferences, beliefs, experiences, and UAI learns what makes you, you. The more you engage, the smarter it gets. And soon, UAI insights emerge, revealing surprising connections and patterns in how you think. It gives you thoughtful, nuanced responses based on a deep understanding of you. UAI believes that by digitizing our minds, we can unlock human potential. We can gain insight into ourselves, deeper relationships with others, and AI assistance which truly empower us. Now, UAI is an ambitious vision for how AI can enhance what makes us human, our minds. By sharing and connecting with our inner worlds, UAI believe that together, we can build that future. Our minds contain infinite potential, and UAI say that their technology helps unlock it. Today is a big day. UAI just released Mind Studio. Mind Studio is an app that allows anyone to create their own AI experience. With an easy to use visual interface, you design interactive prompts and questions to gain context into how people think. In Mind Studio, start by crafting personalized prompts and questions to map how a person thinks. Choose from a range of prompt types, from open-ended questions to images to ratings Select the prompts which provide the most insight into your audience. Organize the prompts into a feed. Reorder or delete them at any time. See what data each prompt collects and export it for analysis. The more people engage with your prompts, the more Mind Studio learns. Insights emerge, showing how different people connect ideas or where their thinking aligns and differs. Next, give your AI instructions for what you want it to do in the AI Composer. Set parameters like temperature to adjust how creative or predictable its responses are. Choose which model powers your AI. MindStudio supports ChatGPT, Claude, and more. Your AI can also have automated responses which trigger based on user input. Once built, 
share your AI for free, or even charge for access. Make it public so others can use and remix it, or keep it private. See how people interact with your AI and refine it over time. Mind Studio opens up AI to all. Anyone can create personalized AI experiences to gain insight, connect with others, and share ideas. Mind Studio believes that AI should enhance human thinking, not compete with it. What will you create with the power of Mind Studio? A new way to understand yourself or others? An AI to share ideas that matters to you? The possibilities of Mind Studio are as endless as the human mind. Now we're going to have a session on the MLST Discord with the UAI folks on Thursday the 13th of July at 9 a.m. PST. You can go into the MLST Discord now and sign up for the events. And uh, they're extremely interested in having a discussion with the wider community to get a feel for where they should take the product and also enlisting help figuring out how to improve their Mind Studio templates. We started by asking Dimitri, um, you know, why he believes the mind can and should be digitized. And from there, we explored mind digitization's potential impacts and implications, the risks, rewards, and deepest questions this radical frontier presents. I hope you'll join us for this glimpse into the future of human progress and possibility in an age of digitized minds. And yeah, let's let the conversation commence. Cheers. Okay, folks, welcome back to MLST. Today we have Dimitri Shapiro. He is the CEO of UAI. Now, prior to founding UAI with the um, CTO, Sean Thielen, Dimitri worked on Google's social machine learning team as a group product leader, and he was also the CTO at MySpace. Now, Dimitri's focus today is going to be UAI, and it's all about building a digital mind which can kind of index everything that you know. And uh, he's coming out of stealth mode, which is pretty cool. So anyway, um, over to you, Dimitri. Why would you want to index your mind? Uh, well, first of all, thanks so much for having me on. Really excited to chat with you. Well, when we take things that didn't used to be digitized and digitize them, we start to be able to do things that we couldn't do before. And so I periodically give an example of, I remember the days when, you know, if you wanted to get somewhere in a car, you had to have a paper map in your car and then sort of pull over and look up the address you were looking for and sort of map it out manually. And then Google, by digitizing roads, you know, was able to create Google Maps. And now we get, you know, not only sort of turn by turn directions, so we don't have to pull over, we can just keep driving, but we get like all kinds of other things. We get traffic rerouting, we get this business is, is going to be closed when you get there, like sort of all of these sort of new capabilities that seem like superpowers. And all of that comes because things are digitized or before we digitized, you know, books, you had to like drive to the library and look up Dewey Decimal System and then you'd sort of find the dead end. But as soon as we digitized things, we got hyperlinking and we got search and we've got all these capabilities. And so the dynamics of digital are radically different than dynamics of physical or biological. And so it stands to reason that if we can, you know, digitize things, whatever they are, we get to get all kinds of potential superpowers. And uh, with the human mind, I think uh, it's clear to us that um, our minds are full of data. We don't think of it as data. In fact, I think most of us find that there are some mental constructs that we are aware of. There are some beliefs, biases, uh, preferences, you know, sort of various types of, of things that we're consciously aware of. Uh, some things, obviously, that we are not aware of, but we feel somehow these things sort of drive us and sometimes make us do things that we sort of, you know, scratch our heads and say, I wonder how I can sort of get rid of that habit. For some reason, I'm sort of drawn to do it. I know it's not good for me, but like, here I am doing that again. Uh, and, and so all of this feels like data. And if we could take that data and digitize it, then we should be able to do all kinds of amazing things with it. Wonderful. So just to give some context, I mean, we'd, we would have spoken about this in the intro, but you're building this incredible platform which learns about the people that use it. 
And behind the scenes, you're using large language models and you're kind of transforming this personalization process into a form of prompting so that the user gets relevant results and that can be platformatized and productionized in a bunch of whole different ways. So we can, we'll talk through the whole process here, but um, I guess we should start with the beginning. So I played with your app and it was a little bit like a TikTok interface. And you would flash through all of these cards and it would ask you lots of very incisive questions so that you could learn more about me. So maybe we should start with the UI itself, because I think that's quite instructive. It, it's almost like there's an element of gamification in there. It's very engaging and the questions are very relevant. How did you come up with that? So we are not intentionally trying to make it feel like it's gamified, although I could see how somebody could get that from it. Um, I think it's clear if we look at what humans like to do, you know, with, with digital, with their phone, is this sort of action of scrolling through feeds, whether it's TikTok or Instagram or Facebook or Twitter, like we like scrolling. This is sort of the natural action. And, and this feels, I think, for many people, um, kind of like calming, kind of like a fidget spinner. And, and so I think it makes us feel good. It's comfort food. We reach for it when we're bored or lonely. It feels good to scroll. And so I, you know, it was really clear to us as we were, you know, thinking about building this interface. And by the way, we're we're still just an alpha, so we're very early on with all of this. Uh, but but it seems clear that that's probably the the right default interface to have to make it sort of plausible for humans to be able to spend um, potentially a lot of time, you know, over their lifetime, sort of going through and engaging with, with this machine. And and uh, these, uh, you know, full viewport sort of scroll interfaces feel like the, the right way to go. Although we sort of considered other types of interfaces as well. But, but that's the reason for it is like, that's, that's what we like to do, and that feels natural, and I think that feels almost like second nature now. People don't have to think about it. They know how to, you know, scroll up and down. Okay, okay. So there's, there's a whole bunch of questions that I was asked, ranging from what kind of food do I like versus, you know, where do I live and how old I am and so on. And these get translated presumably into language model prompts that will make the virtual assistant far more relevant. And... At the moment, is it a static list of questions or is it in somehow, you know, is it somehow dynamically generated? Yeah, so at, at this moment, the list of questions is created by humans using what we call prompt templates. We call these questions prompts. And so you prompt an LLM, but UAI prompts you. And it prompts you with these interactive, again, full screen, um, full stack JavaScript experiences. They can be simple multiple choice questions or open answer questions, but they can be, in fact, games or anything else, multimedia, that can be presented to a user in order to sort of solicit a signal uh, out of their, you know, a reaction, and, and then be able to collect a signal and do something with it. And that signal might be something that is then routed to an LLM, or it might be something that has nothing to do with sort of interfacing with large language models, but simply to digitize our minds and be able to compare ourselves to other people and be able to find anomalies and sort of all of these things. And so we look at all of these prompts. By the way, today we have over 40 different prompt templates that can be configured by humans today uh, to create these prompts. You saw sort of a, a narrow set of those, which are the ones that we have running in alpha right now. But um, soon you will see, you know, quite a diverse set of prompts that are presented to people. So that's sort of the prompt types. There's also the prompt content, sort of the, the topics of the prompts. Again, today, those are chosen by humans. And, and I'm glad that you found it sort of compelling and interesting, but, but they are sort of almost randomly chosen by humans. So here's an idea. I'll have it sort of without much thought about what to present to uh, to users. Over time, we certainly expect um, a large portion of these, if not all of them, to be you know, machine generated and, and obviously personalized. And so I think people will go through potentially quite different paths as they digitize their minds, depending on who they are and how they start. And sort of like each next prompt is going to be influenced by 
prior prompts that, that you've engaged with. Today, the system is, is dumb. It just gives sort of uh, everyone an onboarding set of prompts that are uh, sequenced in an explicit way and then sort of randomly pulls from the corpus of prompts that are available for uh, the rest of the experience right now. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess um, the way I think about it is the, the human mind is exponentially complicated and it, it's really, really difficult to index a human mind. And the way I visualize it is kind of like you have this high dimensional Euclidean space and every time you ask them a question, you're placing a hyperplane in that space and you're placing another one and you're placing another one and you're zeroing in on who that person is. And at the moment, the hyperplanes have been chosen in a principled way. And we can talk about what those principles are. But they're in a way which is quite uniform and, and everyone's being asked the same questions. And then over time, perhaps the, um, the process can become more dynamic. So in response to interactions in the downstream applications, we could be kind of placing new hyperplanes. It's a bit like a search process, totally. refining and refining. Yeah, really, we look at a sort of disambiguation never-ending disambiguation of of um, what might be sort of in, in, inside of humans. And by the way, obviously, we are all changing all the time as well. So this is a process one that you, it's, it's not something you do. You don't digitize your mind, then you stop. If you choose to do this, this is a behavior that you engage with potentially for the rest of your life, theoretically. And as you change, this thing should be able to detect that you're changing uh, through sort of reprompting and prompting from different angles and, and uh, you know, human language prompting, for example, if I was just using language to be able to, to, to prompt people is, is quite crude and, and limited, right? Uh, and, and sort of low resolution potentially. But as you get these multimodal prompts, and again, as the system gets smarter, today it's completely dumb. Uh, but in the future, as it gets smart, then it should be able to um, be quite sophisticated in, in being able to figure out changes in, in your mental models, uh, things that you might feel you are accurately conveying to it. But, you know, we often sort of don't really know ourselves for, for certain things. Like sometimes our friends and family tell us things about ourselves that after some thinking, we're like, oh, they're actually right, but that's not the way I would have described myself. And so we unintentionally, you know, potentially might lie to the system and its job is going to be to be able to to find that disambiguated, sort of propose uh, new ideas, etc. cetera. Yeah, it's quite interesting. On psychological questionnaires, they quite often ask you the same question in different ways and people have a, an internal and an external profile and similarly, we are different people in different situations. And the problem is, from a machine learning point of view, that that's noise, isn't it? So um, I guess, do you, do you represent that with a complex model that could behave differently depending on the situation? Probably. Again, at this moment, we are uh, focused, we're a tiny team. <clears throat> we're focused on sort of the first part of this is how do you get humans mm -hmm. to engage with a feed of these prompts? sort of experimenting with different types of prompts uh, and, and sort of starting to think about how do we um, take them from being, again, sort of randomly chosen by our small team of, of people and, and, and for testing purposes and sort of allowing them to be a, a bit smarter. And so the next step we're taking uh, that you will be the first one to, to hear about outside the company is uh, allowing um, regular users to uh, create collections of prompts and then to be able to take those collections of prompts and, and allow other users to go through them for the purpose of sort of two things. One is to be able to calculate some insights about the group of people that engaged with these prompts, just with some standard sort of, you know, graph analysis at this moment, not really machine learning, so like clustering, anomaly detection, things like that. And then secondarily, to be able to uh, take the output of engagement of these prompts that output some labels, concatenate them, and, and route them as context with a preamble into LLMs. And so this one app's called Context, which allows you to go through a series of prompts. And again, it might be about your preferences in air travel. And as you've gone through that collection of prompts, 
we can now take all of that data and present it to you know ChatGPT or Claude, which are really the two APIs that we have access to today, and allow you to have a conversation with them with this thing being injected sort of per session. Yeah, that makes sense. I guess um, the way I'm thinking about it is you're mixing together different levels of specificity. So in traditional psychology, you know, there was things like Myers-Briggs where they were tried to project you onto all of these different axes of personality. But there's also very specific information, like I prefer United Airlines. And I guess you, the beauty of language models is you can just kind of dump all of that information into a prompt and it will make sense of it depending on how you're calling it, which is really interesting. By the way, I mean, totally. everyone's talking about this. Um, I, I watched an episode, uh, an episode of Lex Friedman interviewing uh, Zuck the other day, and he was saying that they're building virtual assistants and it's really useful for content creators, for example, because they need to uh, replicate themselves. They need to um, scale up their interactions with their fans. And, you know, if I'm if I'm unwell and I, you know, I'm, I'm off from work, I need to be able to send emails and still communicate with people in the, in the workforce. So I think this whole content concept of a virtual assistant is really going to take off. I think that's clear uh, to all of us as well. And, and while we think that's really exciting, like all of the work that's being done in virtual assistants, including by us, we, we kind of see the work we're doing as being much more fundamental than that, where certainly this data that you're collecting, you know, sort of teasing out of your own mind is valuable to be able to train an assistant to do all kinds of uh, things. Um, but at the same time, there's lots of other benefits for humans to digitize minds. Like today, when we meet someone, we have some small talk and we sort of try to figure out who they are, what they're about, and, and over time can get to know a person you know, quite well, obviously our friends and family that we've grown up with. And, but periodically, I don't know if you've experienced this, I've experienced this a number of times in my life where some of my closest friends or family will say something and I'm like, how did I sort of not know this about you? Like after 40 years of being together, how is this something that sort of slipped by? Well, that totally makes sense because there's sort of a limited amount of time and there's a limited number of topics that might come up. And so uh, I guess I suggest that we as humans have a very sort of uh, shallow understanding of one another and sort of knowledge of others' states of mind and when things are digitized, we can have superpowers that we've never had before to be able to understand each other. Like forget digital assistant, just the ability to say, let's again, voluntarily, we both have to enable it. Let's overlay our mental models. And, and this thing can detect where we have things in common, where we have differences, where we have misunderstandings. Just one thing on that, though. Um, we'll, we'll get to the overlaying the minds in a second. But um, there's a phrase that once you know someone and you start to see through them, so there's something about the mystique, there's something about not being able to predict what the person's going to say that kind of makes them interesting and endearing. And do you think that we run the risk of kind of losing that mystique? I don't think so. I, I, I think that we just get to go deeper with people rather than having the mystique be sort of in the shallows of, you know, you two like to play tennis, check. We get to sort of skip all of that and say, great, we both love to play tennis and go into sort of much deeper places. Like, I think it's human nature uh, to want to understand other humans. And, and uh, as we were talking earlier, I think there's sort of the, the depth of the human mind is, is, extraordinarily uh, deep. And uh, so I, I, I don't think that that's really going to be an issue. Like, I mean, I, I've heard sort of arguments like that made before for, you know, serendipity in dating, for example, right? Like, oh, you mm -hmm. go to a dating site and you sort of dial in the person, but wouldn't it be better if you just sort of randomly ran across them on the street? I, I'm not sure that's, that's true. Uh, in fact, I, I think, or, or same thing with whatever, getting access to information, right? Like before search engines, you have to sort of serendipitously be at a place where you would have discovered something. And now as soon as it's digitized, it's sort of much easier. And we haven't run out of things to learn. And so I think this will be the same kind of a, uh, of a dynamic. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm torn on that because I, I agree with Kenneth Stanley. We interviewed him. He, he wrote a book called Why Greatness Cannot Be Planned. And he was talking all about how serendipity plays an outsized role in our lives. And I agree with you that, the, in a sense, the mind is, is insanely complex, but it depends on the level of resolution. And that was kind of where I was going with that spectrum of specificity, because while there are some general principles, so on a dating website, you, you do tend to match people based on their rough attractiveness and age and interests and so on. But, but then there's this huge spectrum of, of kind of creative serendipity. And um, yeah, I just think that's if you think about the exponential blow up when you get all of these different situational features that kind of come together and they behave in unpredictable ways, that's when you get the chaos. Totally. Look, I, no, no, sorry. I'm, I hope I didn't miscommunicate. I, I think this provides opportunity for more and deeper serendipity than mm. sort of random serendipity. Uh, the ability to... Uh, Get, get into the, the interesting things with people that you may have never gotten into because you were sort of stuck in shallows and didn't realize there was like all of this interesting things about that person that you can discover serendipitously still. Uh, you, you may have passed them by uh, on the street and sort of not spent time with them or whatever. You were sitting on the park bench with them and you started to have small talk and then all of a sudden, you know, wandered off but didn't realize this person you were sitting next to had all kinds of amazing things for you to discover beyond that and so you need sort of a, a tease of that perhaps like i don't think we'll ever be able to like uh let me take that back i think we might be able to sort of a you know in, in time to to get all of this so that most serendipity sort of disappears and you'll be able to see through a person uh i, I wonder if humans will sort of prior to that sort of create some ways to say this stuff you don't get to see and this stuff you do get to see. We've kind of already thought of that. Uh, we're going to release a, a people matching app that does specifically what I was just telling you, which is like lets you overlay your mental model with someone else or in groups to be able to see how groups sort of uh, think and, and where there's alignment and misalignment. And part of that is going to be the ability to say, look, this information is sort of not shareable or shareable in different tiers. I can sort of ratchet it up depending on how comfortable I feel with you of like how much I uh, I share of my of of my debts yeah yeah so um almost like planes of privacy so you have these yeah. different concentric circles and and you say um this is my public profile this is my work profile the only thing with that though is we're dealing with algorithms that can find you know surface correlations in all sorts of things that you are unaware of and you might inadvertently be revealing things about yourself without realizing. Absolutely. Yeah, I think I think there's going to be uh, lots of lots of new uh, problems to solve as as we start to to see kind of what's happening once people get some of this data out. Okay. Okay. Um, just before we move back to the privacy thing, we haven't really spoken about some of the downstream ap applications. So, so you guys have built this entire engine for profiling and indexing a mind. And then people can build applications on the end of it, and you've built a bunch of them already. So uh, could you just talk about you know, some of the potential applications that people could build and, and how they would do that? Yeah, so um, today... Uh, the platform isn't available for third-party developers to be able to uh, build applications on top of it, but certainly that is planned uh, for the future. Um, next year feels like probably the, the time where we will start to address that. Um, our team prior to building UAI actually built a developer platform called Koji that allows third-party developers to very rapidly build um, applications. Uh, and, and also have access to sort of shared data and, and, and shared services, payments, things like that. Um, so today, the applications that we have and have planned are all first-party applications. Uh, from the vantage point where we are now, uh, and I'm certain that things will change as, as we move forward, both for us and for other people, to be able to see more clearly, you know, what applications could be built utilizing data like this. Um, we <clears throat> see three areas that um, seem obvious. 
sort of one area is uh, sort of personal, where I can use this data that I'm digitizing, pulling out of my mind, and the system could help me better understand myself. And that could be everything sort of from visualizations that are created that sort of potentially render, like imagine like a force directed graph of some of these, you know, beliefs that I might have and how they're related to other beliefs. And I can start to visualize uh, how sort of the inside of my mind works. Uh, so things like that or things that feel kind of like therapy, for example, that can take a bunch of this data that I've pulled out and then be able to potentially suggest to me that I might have um, some propensity for one thing or some deficiency or some gaps in knowledge, sort of like a lot of things where I can learn about myself by digitizing my mind. So that's sort of one set of applications. Uh, another set is um, really sort of human to human communication, um, sort of two humans, as we were just talking about the ability to um, overlay our mental model with another human and be able to understand each other better. Um, or group applications where, you know, when people work in teams or various groups of people, communication and alignment uh, sort of is our, our, our challenges. And, and, you know, many times uh, I can point to sort of frustration of trying to align a, a team of people and, and spending time in meetings and writing documents and, and sort of asking them, are we aligned? And they would say, yes, we're aligned. And I'd say, great, tell me what it is we're doing so that I can understand that we're aligned. And they're able to say the words that feel like we're aligned. And then all of a sudden, for some reason, it feels like we're executing not in alignment, right? Not rowing in the same direction. Why is that? I think, again, I think it's because these sort of situations that we we find ourselves in, whether they're meetings or whatever conversations, uh, we describe sort of a point in time, something that is an outcome or some path, but uh, the vantage point from which we are speaking, sort of the vector on which we're looking at it and conceiving it, actually aren't aligned. And so when we describe our intersection, we think we are, but as we see sort of action, it's not. And so we believe that there can be a bunch of applications that can take all of this data and test for alignment, test for understanding of, you know, goals and, and, and uh, uh, gaps in knowledge and things like that and, and sort of team dynamics. So that's certainly another area that we think there's lots of applications to be built. And then the third area is really this using this data to be able to interface with, with the world of digital. And uh, I think it should be clear to, to people that at this moment, humans are the bottleneck in being able to leverage all of this innovation and information technology. Like, I think we passed that sort of crossroads a while back. Like there are countless applications that I could be using, should be using that would make me better, happier, more productive, et cetera. But I have no time or sort of ability to be able to leverage all those applications. And so what good is it that we get more innovation if, if humans sort of can't leverage it? Or in another example, you get sort of these amazing new things with these generative AI models. And all you have to do is tell them what to do in a text box, you know, with your thumbs, because most of us are on mobile. That doesn't seem like the right interface to be able to leverage all the power, sort of to wield the power of these new information technologies. We believe uh, a better approach is to sort of meet them where they are, meaning to, to turn ourselves into digital and then al allow ourselves to take this sort of data set that we've teased out of our mind and, and grant it to technologies that can take either a bunch of raw data and, and be able to do something with it, meaning find structure in it and, and, and be able to then leverage this multidimensional um, set of data uh, or, you know, data that's been formatted and, and then can sort of be um, used in these various different services. And so you can imagine um, if you're trying to book a trip to Disneyland, you know, today you, ha you might go to ChatGPT and do some ideation then you might go to Google and verify that, you know, these things actually exist and you're not sort of getting a bunch of hallucinations. 
then you got to do sort of a bunch of research and price shopping and, and comparison and calendaring with you and your, you know, travel partners and, and, and communication and all of that. And all of that is being done by you. But people who are, you know, much wealthier than I am uh, have personal assistants. And so if they want to go to Disneyland, they can just say, hey, Bob, I want to take the family to Disneyland. And Bob can go off and do all of that because Bob uh, can sort of make countless assumptions about me and my family because Bob understands me and my family. And then sort of synthesize all of that and summarize it and come back and say, look, there are really three viable options and here are the pros and cons of each. And I can then sort of take those and you know confer with my wife and say, Bob will take option B. And then Bob could go off and interact with all of these services and, and sort of execute these various steps in order to be able to do that. And whether that's completely autonomous or that is Bob proposing and I say, yes, go, 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 go. You know, I think all of these things will depend on like what what is the action and and how much these systems are uh, effective at being able to do that without errors. Yeah, and um, I like that option of making it semi-interactive because if it was completely non-interactive, then the potential for misalignment would be higher. That you could identify the dimensions where there is most uncertainty and then have this kind of interactive process to hone in on on the true alignment. Um, you mentioned so many interesting things there, actually. Um, so many. Th- I wanted to actually speak about um, almost all of them. Maybe we should start with the group alignment thing in the office, because I think that's very interesting. Um, I can attest to this personally, the amount of countless hours that have been wasted. You know what it's like in a business. There's no grown-ups in the room. There's lots of misalignments. And um, in my startup company, we even all had a personality profile to help us get on with each other better. And uh, my, my uh, co-host, Keith Duggar, he, he's uh, quite low on empathy and he's very pedantic. And it's very, very easy to kind of get emotional and to misinterpret the intention behind an action. Right. And it's one of those things that just like when you're in a relationship with your wife over many, many years, you start to actually understand the causes, the reason for the behavior. And, and it makes you um, interpret the situation completely differently. It's like, it's like when you're when your baby spills some food over the floor, you know, there's no malintent there. It's just a baby. And then you, and you kind of interpret the situation differently. But but the only question there, though, is there's so much complexity in our personality profiles. So where where I also want to go with this is sometimes this information is not in the data. So it's not deducible from the textual interactions we have, which is why you're coming at it from this additional top-down approach, which is creating a structure and asking specific questions to try and divide up that personality space. But it still seems like there might be a bit of a gap in the middle where you might still not be able to represent the nuance. I I think that's absolutely true. Um, So... There's a bunch of things there. One is personality tests like Myers-Briggs, for example, and there's like a bunch of other of these assessments, right? Psychological assessments are, are crafted with some hypothesis in mind. And then people go through these tests in order to sort of like in a tree structure, in order to bucket themselves into sort of like one bucket or another bucket. Um, and, and while those are sort of valuable, they are you know quite low in resolution, and you sort of get crudely lumped into this sort of stereotype in a sense, a caricature. And obviously, humans are infinitely more complex than that. And so the approach we're taking, sort of first thing that's different is is that it, it is not like a personality test. It, you know, like it does not have sort of something in mind to try to bucket you in. It's simply a bunch of data points, right? Give presented with this prompt, this user engaged with it in this way. And when you get a bunch of these data points, I sort of compare it to a a digital images made of pixels, right? And and sort of one pixel doesn't say much, a hundred pixels don't say much, but when you get many pixels, you can start to see an image. Initially low resolution, but the more pixels there, there are, the higher resolution it is. This too, in a sense, is doing that, except it's going to do it in vector space. And, and so it's not a, a digital image, sort of flat image, but a bunch of data points that can then sort of be differentiate you from me, for example, right? And then some places we will be quite aligned and in other places we will be potentially polar opposites. And uh, so I think there's really sort of a, a spectrum of this alignment and, and, and 
at how we'll get there. Initially, it, it's going to be quite crude, which is uh, if you take a, a group of people and you give them a bunch of prompts and imagine like these prompts are about a project that we're all working on. And so these prompts could be created by, again, one of our team members or potentially be even generated these days by, let's say, a large language model, sort of given given some some context about the things that we're working on. It can generate a bunch of prompts to see if we are in alignment. Uh, and those prompts could be sort of as crude as like, well, what's success look like? And, and given sort of multiple choice and pick all the things that apply, right? Multi-select, multiple choice. What is it that we're trying to do here? And I'm certain, again, in my experience from having built three venture-backed companies and, and, and worked at, at Google in my space on large teams, that when you get a team of people and you give them a bunch of questions like that, that you will find anomalies where people will miss it and say, pick other things. And that should be quite easy to just attack again, no, no machine learning required and say, look, we're misaligned here. And and by the way, then can go and sort of remedy that situation. Um, and then, uh, and again, imagine that with sort of many prompts in, in, in different uh, prompt templates in different ways with disambiguation and things like that. So there's a lot of work that can be done just with, you know, sort of very simple uh, group prompt prompting. Uh, and then over time, as these things get more intelligent and you start to build models that can really sort of take a bunch of these data points and find sort of dimensions that have nothing to do with sort of explicit misalignment, but but can deal with, you know, some things that, again, we might be able to see it in data and not be able to even have a label for it because we won't exactly understand, you know, what's happening in the misalignment. But certainly statistically, it's showing that there's something there. And again, that could be things like attitude and and, you know, a person could be going through some, you know, personal issues at the time. They might be distracted. Like, there are all these things that you can't really capture in in language and, and, and questions, but, but can be seen uh, in, in sort of anomalies of, um, of data. Yeah, um, I was just thinking as well, it's quite similar to in um, moral frameworks. You know, you have... Uh, deontological principles which is that you know thou shall not kill or there are just certain principles that that i adhere to and then there's kind of consequentialism which is that there are certain um outcomes that that i don't like so sometimes the the ends might justify the means and i guess with alignment as you were just talking to there's there's behaviors and there's goals and principles and so many different things and we have to kind of construct this alignment space and some of it might not be deducible from the data it might it might come from different things but this reminds me a little bit of this um area called quantified self i'm not sure if you've heard of that but i i used to every day i kept a, a mind diary and I, re I recorded how i was feeling on the day and every day i had to create a new category because it was slightly nuanced and all of the previous 300 categories didn't quite cover it and very similar with language processing you know like human rules don't really work very well for this kind of thing and we need to have neural network models that can see patterns that perhaps we couldn't in you know intuit or, or understand um so yeah i think there's something really interesting there yeah look uh, i often explain to people that even though we're called UAI, uh, you could very much think of us as being sort of in the field of quantified self. Like mm. this is what you're doing by digitizing your mind is, is you are quantifying your mental models. Um, and uh, speaking of Lex Friedman, I, I recently saw Brian Johnson uh, on, on Lex's show and, and they were talking about uh, kernel flow, this like helmet that kernel has been developing. Uh, I'm not sure if, if, if uh, viewers uh, know this. There's really two companies that are doing a really interesting thing. One company is called Neuralink, which is an Elon Musk company that that has a, a brain implant uh, that uh, they haven't brought to market yet, but is in research that sort of uh, allows uh, there to be stimuli presented to people and then sort of measuring uh, brain waves and, and electromagnetic sort of uh, in chemical reactions in, in human brains and, and then being able to digitize that. And then Brian Johnson's company, which is Kernel with a K. And uh, they've got this like helmet that you put on and uh, it, uh, it it uses light, sort of the same thing as we do with the Apple Watch and, and sort of monitors, you know, blood flow in, in the human skull uh, as stimuli is presented and then digitizes it and, and you know, potentially will have some applications in the future. 
Uh, you could look at us as doing something similar, except while those two companies are focused on the human brain and sort of require hardware, uh, we are focused on, on the mind and require no hardware, uh, meaning you, a phone or, or a computer, and, and sort of using uh, you know, eyes and ears and, and, and other sensors we have to be able to get access to what's inside our head. Yeah, but I'd like to explore that a little bit because in a way it's a distinction without a difference. Now, you know, um, Andy Clark came up with this concept called the extended mind, which is that our phone is an extended mind. And you're talking about the, the extreme end of the spectrum where you actually have a neural implant and you can do something that I think it's referred to as neural feedback, where in direct response to some stimuli, you get a strong signal and you can change your behavior. Whereas with this technology, there's a bit of a gap. I'll, I'll look at my virtual assistant and it will give me some some guidance. And the only, I guess I can see it in a good way and a bad way. So when I work with, with Keith, for example, um, we now are like a married couple and I understand if we're going down a bad path and I can kind of, I can change it very quickly. Like when you meditate, you learn that here is a thought train, it's going in a bad place, I'm just going to press the stop button right now. And it's all about making that process, that reflexive process more and more efficient. And you can argue that, that it's a good thing but you could also argue that in a way it kind of removes some of the, the character and creativity of life because it creates this consensus. Do you know what I mean? It, 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 yeah. in, it kind of like removes some of the spark in a way. Uh, I think certainly there's a part of that that's true, which is when you um, have worked with somebody for a long time, like I worked with my co-founder Sean now for... Um, seven years full-time and then another two years sort of part-time. And we can say very few words <clears throat> and be able to describe uh, a tremendous amount of, of, of sort of implied things that, that don't need to be said. Mm. And, and so it's a really sort of magical communication. Uh, uh, but then on the other hand, again, it, it feels like it's, it, you know, it, it's limited because we sort of instantly go into that and, and might have a hard time sort of uh, uh, breaking out of, of, of that kind of a pattern. But, but at the same time, again, I, I think the more, the, the more we can digitize, the more we can sort of use digital also to potentially sort of propose expanding uh, the, whether it's a, again, a project that we're working on that can then sort of be I expanded digitally and, and get us to think in different ways and sort of like prompt us to be able to do that, pull us out of our sort of natural tendencies. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, I think hard to predict what happens when we humans get these new capabilities. We've never had them before. Yeah. We've never had the capability to instantly know so much about a person or to be able to realize that the people that we've been dealing with this whole time, you know, our friends and family and colleagues, all of a sudden now we see tremendous amount more resolution about them and start to see things that might feel... I, I think it might actually end up feeling a little bit like when you get a, a, a high-definition TV versus sort of a, a standard TV. All of a sudden, everything looks sort of like a soap opera because everything is is uh, is now HD. And so I think we might experience a similar feeling uh, for a bit when, when this happens. But at the same time, I guess I'm a believer that the higher resolution is better. Yeah, so, so many things to touch on there. It, it's genuinely mysterious and... I, like you, am fascinated by, let's say, the the, um, the potential for GPT-type models to be pedagogical and to help us with education. And some people say they make us lazy and they make us disengaged. And they certainly change the way that you do educate yourself because now you can ask increasingly specific questions and you can go directly to the information you need, whereas before you might have had a top-down exploratory process. And there's actually many counterfactual paths that you explored that did not lead anywhere interesting. But there's still something interesting about exploring those counterfactual paths. And similarly, when you get to know someone, 
Um, first of all, it's in many cases, it's not good to know them completely at the beginning because you might not even want to be friends with them in the first place if you knew too much. So there's, it needs to be partially observable. And then there's something about exploring bad pathways many times and learning your lesson and, oh, I've been stung once, so I'm not going to go there again. It, it's like when you, when you bring up your children, you've learned so many lessons in life you've been around the sun so many times and you want to stop them from doing stupid things but you can't lead a horse to water right you know you, they have to make their own mistakes and i guess like there's an element of something now i not don't want to call it paternalism but to what extent do people need to kind of like make their own mistakes uh, i don't know but i have five <laughs> kids and uh the oldest one is nine and and so I, I feel like I live in a research lab of, of you know, cognitive <laughs> development. Uh, I certainly, yes, yes. like other parents, have the instinct of uh, wanting them not to make, um, you know, bad mistakes, obviously, uh, but realizing that allowing them to make mistakes is extremely important. I, I don't think that, that any of this, whether it's LLMs or the work we're doing with, with digitizing the mind, needs to necessarily preclude that. Uh, in fact, mm. it could sort of instrument that. It, it could intentionally be sort of smarter instead of sort of just general serendipitous lessons in hardship, uh, making mistakes. This thing can present situations and have you learn the lesson, verify that you've learned the lesson. If you have not yet learned the lesson, find other ways to be able to get you to learn the lesson. Like we can be intelligent about being able to create those types of, of stimuli and opportunities for humans to to learn lessons, whether they're kids or, or adults. Um, so I think there's like a lot of interesting stuff uh, there. Uh, on the side of, of education, uh, so I, I was a really poor student. Uh, I, I, you know, now that I'm an adult, I can blame all kinds of things and give it labels like ADD and things like that. But generally, I, I think I was bored and and, and I'm interested in, and I, I tend to learn in a way where uh, I want to choose the next sort of thing to look at. And so like learning by um, conversationally in, in chatting with an LLM is awesome, right? It's sort of the next step beyond like what we've gotten with YouTube, which I can jump from video to video and hear people talk about the same concept from different angles. And like, so that also has been like transformative for me, just following a teacher's reasoning has always been a struggle for me and, and you know, many other people that I know. Um, but I actually think there's something much more powerful that comes from um, uh, specifically mind digitization uh, when it comes to learning. I think the biggest problem uh, sort of in this dimension that humans have is we don't know what we don't know. And, and we, we might craft some queries, some prompts for LLMs to try to figure out this thing that we think we're trying to figure out, but we really don't even know how to craft the prompts. And we obviously have limited time also, and so there's like only so much time you can spend on that. But if we digitize our minds, and again, as this digitization algorithm in a sense gets more sophisticated, as I mentioned earlier today, it's just completely dumb. But as it gets smart, it should be able to detect our, you know, uh, sort of knowledge graph of our own mind and then be able to find gaps in knowledge and then be able to proactively sort of synthesize materials and, and present them to us in sort of the thing is like a jigsaw puzzle, like this mega dimensional jigsaw puzzle of our, of our knowledge graph uh, and, and sort of create learnings that connect the subject to things that we already know in, in this personalized way. And so completely personalized learning materials, content generation. And by the way, if that's the case, then you start to potentially extrapolate from that and, and you could get to a place where it feels like there's no reason for anyone to create websites anymore or for content, human content creators to create content because now the machine can create custom content for each one of us on the fly. And, and and that might be radically more compelling and productive and uh, obviously would fundamentally change uh, what the internet is and how we how we use it and and you know implications for now 
tens of millions, actually over 100 million people who see themselves as being content creators. I know there's a famous meme where you have someone using GPT to generate an email and then someone on the other side uses GPT to summarize the email and, and the email just becomes this kind of redundant artifact. And yeah, it is going to be like that in terms of consuming content. But then you get this weird situation where the models are built on the content and most of the content will be generated in the future. So where does the fresh content come from? But I, I wanted to uh, touch on something you said as well, just quickly, which is, um, yeah, I'm, I'm fascinated by education. And I think I'm one of the luckiest people alive because we grew up in the traditional system and we know what's interesting, right? Because a big part of it is the discrimination. We, we know what the areas of interestingness are. We've been educated and I can go on GPT and I can explore the philosophy of mind, all sorts of different topics that I'm interested in. If you're a kid growing up now, what do you actually do if you have a complete blank slate, right? How, how do you actually find something interesting to start drilling into? And that's the dichotomy, I think, between discrimination and, and generation. I think the, the, the real opportunity in these generative AI models is not for us humans to ask them to do things and, and, and they do them. That's obviously ex extraordinarily compelling and countless implications for productivity and creativity and all of that. Um, but sort of to turn that around and, uh, you know, for example, if, if, if I was to meet a genie and the genie said, you can ask me, you know, I know everything. You can ask me any question you want. I believe the right question to ask the genie is, what, what question should I ask you? What don't I know that I should know? And, and have the genie sort of take the lead and say, aha, that's the right question. Well, but for me to answer that question, I'd need to better understand you. And so let me ask you a bunch of questions and then I'll figure out what you know, what you don't know. And then be able to, to sort of prompt you now with uh, new capabilities of like, which of these things do you find interesting, for example, and now we can go in and learn these things. Does that yeah, make sense? Yeah, but, oh, it does, yeah. I think the, the only pushback on that is there's an infinite number of potentially interesting things. And even now, if you look at people's interests, it's not uniformly distributed. Um, there's a huge weight for, towards, for example, skills and interests, which would make you valuable on the market. So everyone wants to be a software engineer and, and learn artificial intelligence and perhaps not work in the local hospital or something like that. So, But I, I guess I don't know whether that could be balanced out in some way if, if, if it was different. Uh, I think so. Uh, again, I, th I think today when we humans are the ones in control that are driving sort of our spotlight of, you know, where do we shine it to try to learn more about something? We are driven by um, sort of all kinds of uh, 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 things that we try to optimize for and optimizing for having a, you know, a, a lucrative career is a, is a strong force and therefore drives people to spend their time focused on learning new skills in that. Um, but if, if, again, if things could be turned around and now not only can they do that and sort of guide it, but they start to get a bunch of proposals of other things that might be interesting for them to learn and perhaps that could also influence positively this other thing that they wanted to learn sort of indirectly. Uh, I think you can imagine all kinds of applications that, that create shortcuts and, and give us back a bunch of our time and being able to, to learn stuff. Like, for example, there are a lot of people now that are studying to be prompt engineers, right? Like, that's, like, really interesting, like all of these videos that have come out and, and, and courses for, for people to learn to speak to, to an LLM, um, and then people, okay, fine. So I, I want to be a prompt engineer. And then, you know, they go and they start to go into the weeds and like they look up gradient descent and and, and, and they start sort of refreshing their math skills and, and going into all these other things that are really completely irrelevant to being able to, to create prompts. Like it, it doesn't help you any if you understand gradient descent to be able to then craft a better prompt, I believe. Uh, and that should be made clear to people uh, uh, and, and could be, where today, when they're the ones in the driver's seat, uh, they have no real ability to be able to discern what 
you know, what things are relevant, what things are not relevant, and and how to sort of connect yeah. all of this. On on that though, that that nicely dovetails with the point I was going to make, which is that um, I mean, growing up, I've done so many stupid things, and a lot of it is because I behaved irrationally. And I wish I could just go back and tell myself, you know, and I, I knew I was being irrational. I just did a stupid thing and I needed someone to tell me, look, you know, you should be doing that. Why have you done this? Driven by your emotion or whatever. But the, the prompt engineering one is quite an interesting one because sometimes there are hidden rationalizations. So the reason why prompt engineers learn about gradient descent is because they want to signal um, on social media that they have technical chops to distinguish themselves. And that's quite a common pattern. So they don't need to know it. Totally, totally. Yeah, yeah, no, that, that, that's for sure. Look, there, I, there are all kinds of uh, reasons that, that uh, people go into uh, whatever, various areas and, 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 and sort of play around and, and, and uh, get a little bit of depth, depth of knowledge and then sort of move on and say, okay, this isn't relevant to me, I'll, I'll go somewhere else. Uh, but again, I don't think that any of this really precludes that. In fact, I mean, it's sort of like the temperature parameter in an LLM, right? Like you can introduce chaos into, into systems and, uh, you know, either sort of true chaos where you sort of randomly, in a sense, go in and, and find new distractions that might be interesting and, and dive in or sort of more intelligent chaos that might... Uh, feel like chaos, but at the end of the day, you know, it's all sort of orchestrated to get you into a, a, a healthy state, whatever it is that you choose to be a healthy state. Like, I think that still should be human choice. We all shouldn't be in a sense manipulated to become like everyone else and, and sort of all knowing on all of these areas that are valuable for humans to, if you're talking sort of about education, sort of knowledge, uh, that everybody sort of knows the same things. Uh, I, I think one of the challenges here is going to be as, as we digitize our minds and as this thing prompts us to be able to uh, understand our, our desires, our human desires, and, and help us get there and help us achieve those things that it is that we uh, you know, feel like we're trying to achieve. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that there's a magic balance of um, entropy and, and energy to coin Carl Friston's free energy principle. And there are there are certain pressures in, in society which cause a kind of converging effect. And I think having just the right amount of chaos and, and divergence keeps the whole system interesting. But I wanted to move over a little bit to some of the privacy and the tech stuff. So, um, yeah, you're, you're asking some, um, in some cases, quite personal questions. And I just wondered, could you just go through your privacy policy and how is that information stored and shared? If at all, yeah. So uh, it is uh, all of it is still in the works. So we have an alpha privacy policy, and as as the system evolves, we will evolve with that as well. Um, generally, you know, we think obviously it's really important to to follow best practices in information security and, and privacy. And so everything in the system is encrypted. There's access controls. Uh, no team members of UAI have any access to your data, no, nor will they. Um, all users are, are um, you know, sort of private. All we require from you right now to log in is an email address and a password. If you are really sensitive about privacy, you might want to create a fresh email address and only use that for, uh, for the system. If you want to go next level, you might want to connect with VPN. So, like, I think we allow humans to sort of choose their levels of privacy there. Uh, today, no one sort of no other user knows that you exist as a user, and so you're sort of truly invisible and anonymous. Uh, we there's a prompt in there. It says, "What should I call you?" It, it was intentionally made to say that rather than "What is your name?" Right? And so you can sort of choose whatever you want. And so I, I think at the end of the day, the human is in control of how much data they digitize and and how much they sort of trust the system. We obviously understand that's going to be sort of cornerstone of people feeling comfortable with being able uh, to do that. Um, sort of beyond that, uh, you know, there are approaches, again, we haven't implemented them yet, but like sort of differential privacy or synthetic data and things like that that will, uh, as you start to get into sort of 
potentially again third party applications using this and, and other things that sort of real data isn't shared. Uh, you get synthetic data that sort of uh, represents uh, the, the data set, uh, but with with um, uh, sort of ambiguity there of, of, of who it is. And, and so you can never really trace it back to, to people. But again, all of that, it's really sort of in the early days here now. Okay, okay. Yeah, because um, I guess if you're using something like um, OpenAI's API behind the scenes, that doesn't store any data. So right. then... I guess the main the main thing I would pick up on is if you are in any way leaking or sharing information between the customers. Is is, is it just completely isolated at the moment? It, it is completely isolated. Yeah, the only time yeah. that information might be shared between customers is when you voluntarily, again, like some of these applications that I proposed, mm -hmm. where you are comparing yourself to other people, uh, where you voluntarily. Uh, explicitly say, I would like to sort of overlay data. And there you'll have these like different uh, layers of, of privacy that you'll get to choose. Awesome. So the killer question is, and it's okay if you're not allowed to answer this, but which backend LLM are you using? Uh, no, I'm, I'm happy to answer it. So uh, r right now it's, uh, it cha it's uh, ChatGPT. It's the DaVinci API uh, that we're using. Oh, uh, old and, um Actually, as of yesterday, we are uh, also integrating Claude via API, so Anthropic's uh, model as well. But again, we really see ourselves as being sort of model agnostic. Um, as as uh, there are more models that are created, more sort of APIs available, uh, we'll integrate to those. And, and again, depends on whether a human sort of manually gets to choose what model they're interacting with, or there's some intelligence that sort of Potentially, by the way, could use multiple models simultaneously and, and, and find correlations and disambiguation. And some models might be, not might be, I'm certain will be stronger in, in, in you know, some respects and other models in other respects. Uh, we sort of feel like we are uh, sitting um, in this like really special vantage point, sort of closest to the user, closest to the human, to be able to assist the human, again, to leverage like all of this power of information technology. And, and I also don't believe that it's simply like everything goes simply to us speaking to large language models. Like there'll be other services that are available that might be the right services to communicate with that have nothing to do necessarily with language, booking services to book your travel, blah, blah, blah. Uh, where, uh, you know, sort of a, a chat interface, even with like plugins and things like that, is sort of not the most effective interface to be able to, to leverage that. And so... Uh, We'll, we'll see as we move yeah. forward, like how all of that develops. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a few things on that. Absolutely. So we need to have an intermediate service which can use tools. It can access my calendar. It can send emails. It can do this, that, and the other. It's plugged into all of the things that I use. On Anthropic, I finally got access to it yesterday. Uh, the, um, the 100K context model. My God, it's beautiful. Although, unfortunately, I was a little bit let down because um, I, I pasted an entire Stanford Plato article in, I think, on computationalism earlier. And it was beautifully summarizing, answering questions and so on. And I guess I just assumed that it was perfectly, you know, looking at everything in the context window. I pasted in a two hour interview that I did yesterday on MLST and I told it to generate a table of contents and it only seemed to be aware of the last 40 minutes in the conversation. So because I knew what was in that conversation, I could immediately see that it was it had blind spots. So um, I think apparently they're using the alibi uh, model to do that that context, um, you know, to work on a larger context. So they, they probably need to do a bit of work there. But anyway, I mean, in principle, having a large context window is amazing for you guys because you can just stick an entire book of information in there about the person. For sure. And, and you know, we, we believe that all those context windows are going to get larger and larger. Uh, over time, mm -hmm. I mean, there's probably some limit, but but still uh, feels like we're we're not there. Uh, and then we can also sort of do in the process sort of summarization and 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 sort of get some if it's starting to hit the limit, get it to summarize and sort of reduce the the dimensions and and reprompt itself with with a summary rather than sort of an explicit list. And they seem to do that well. So. Um You've built this entire pipeline, you've got people using it, and I guess the question is, are you evaluating in any way what the lift is? So, yeah, t tell me about that. Have you, have you designed any evaluations? 
Sorry, well, you mean the lift in, in sort of the, the, the personalization and the output of the model? How different is it from... Yeah, I mean, it's not clear to me how you would measure, is it relevance or satisfaction or something like that? So, you know, but perhaps you could, I don't know if you've done A-B testing or something, and here's, here's without the personalized information, how much of an improvement does it, does it yield? We've, uh, we've done some, some qualitative, not quantitative uh, testing of that, both uh, obviously with our team, and also we have uh, over 2,500 people now in the alpha that are using it, and around 700 people in Discord. And, and so again, there's some qualitative reports of uh, uh, Lyft. Uh, I think, you know, all of it is, is quite subjective uh, until somebody sort of potentially spends some time to really develop um, some you know, sort of more objective benchmarking for, for uh, the sort of delta in personalization or not personalization. Uh, and, and there might also be sort of a placebo effect uh, that, that is in play where people might feel like this, whatever, give me a movie recommendation. And you could say it just to chat GPT and it'll give you a movie recommendation and you can pass it a bunch of sort of parameters and uh, as context and say, give me a movie recommendation and gives you something else. And you might look at that and say, well, they're both great movies, and but, but they're different. And so it sort of did something different and you can even get it to explain to you like why it sort of used these different parameters and why it believes that uh, that this is the right recommendation, but is is that the right recommendation or not? It's it's hard to tell. I think in general, sort of with recommendation, uh, that that's sort of always been an issue. Like, are the YouTube recommendations we're getting the right ones? Um, they're better than no recommendations. Although, to the conversation we were having earlier, you kind of lose that serendipity of sort of like randomly getting stuff thrown at you. And, uh, and and get into, you know, echo chamberish dynamics. Yeah, and there's there's a few interesting things there as well. And I'm sure you've, you've seen tree of thought and process reasoning from OpenAI. And, and increasingly, there are ways of prompting these models where instead of just giving you the answer, they give you the entire, you know, step-by-step -step process of reasoning. And, of course, that's an intelligible explanation as well that, that, that you can give in, in your downstream assistant. Yeah, in fact, I've seen some of the uh, sort of research on on those being sort of really important in in, in prompt engineering of, of getting it to sort of go step by step and, and sort of say you know use use this methodology to be able to to respond to me. Um, this app that we will be launching, uh, I think it's going to be called Context. This ability for um, users to show up and, and create this collection of prompts and then sort of manipulate uh, a, a preamble, uh, sort of prompt engineer, and and sort of have a uh, an IDE type interface uh, that allows you to test different preambles and, and context and, and sort of fine tune that and then sort of package that for any person to show up and not have to do that work. All they have to do is engage with the prompts and now they've configured this like very sophisticated uh, uh, prompt that would go and, and hit whatever, any of these large language models that we integrate to. Uh, I think the, the, we'll find all kinds of sort of exciting things happening with, with people playing around with those types of approaches. You need to call it Mind Studio. That would be like uh, that would be a cool name <laughs> for, for the for the app. Um, but no, I mean, one of the cool things there is um, again on quantified self. Um, I don't know whether you've noticed that the Apple Health app. It doesn't really give you any any useful actionable information. It just gives you your average heart rate and your sleep patterns and so on, and it's all very boring. And the reason for that, of course, is it's very open to interpretation. There's lots of contextual stuff there. But one thing you could really do to help people is, as well as having this information actually give them give them intelligible and actionable explanations for for what it means totally let's move on to some of the slightly more philosophical topics because our, our audience loves all of that so um do you remember that service replica where you could have a digital girlfriend and many of those folks developed emotional um, relationships with these non-biological entities and then they famously restricted the service and all of the girlfriends died and everyone was up, up in arms about it. I mean, do, do you think, 
you know, we're moving towards a world now where increasingly the line is going to blur between digital minds and real minds, and that seems to come with some responsibility. Uh, responsibility for the model creators or responsibility for the humans that are engaging with the replicas? Well, and I would argue both because if you argued, as Daniel Dennett might argue, that these are digital minds, they're replicas, they, in some sense, there's no distinction between a digital mind and, and a real human being. Therefore, you can't really just turn it off if people have developed attachments to it. Totally. I, I, uh, my mom develops attachments to sort of inanimate objects. And, uh, for example, a car that we used to own. And, and when we were selling the car, she felt like this heartbreak of uh, the, this car sort of leaving the, the family. And so I think that's sort of mm. a a human condition that we develop attachments to um, all kinds of things, obviously other humans, that's an obvious one, but inanimate objects, or in this case, uh, you know, synthetic humans, let's, let's call it sort of like these sophisticated models that, that feel very human like. Uh, and, and I think this is sort of a new, um, you know, sort of a, a, a new set of problems that that we will be exploring of, of you know, what does that mean that if you're attached to this thing and all of a sudden it goes away, uh, there, there's obviously grief and loss and these emotions. And, uh, and on one hand, those might seem like negative emotions. On the other hand, those are wonderful emotions, right? That's what it means to be human, to feel that. And many people, you know, for whatever reason, might not have access to other humans that will break their heart. And in this case, the, yeah. the AI models might serve that purpose and, and teach them valuable lessons and get their endorphins going in, in various ways. I know, but we don't want to break people's hearts. I mean, I, I agree with you that suffering is part of the human condition and that that's part of the the, the journey of learning in many ways but I don't want it I don't want to insinuate that you're trivializing it by comparing it to inanimate objects but that there are people who believe that if you do create a replica of a digital mind which is to say and this is an interesting side thing by the way that um, psychologists now are, are using the language of psychology to understand how language models work and there's even people seriously writing papers about them having a theory of mind and goals and beliefs. And there are other people so talking about existential threats, of course. But, um, you know, in, in some sense, this is really different to an inanimate object. Of course, of course. Yeah. No, no the only reason I was bringing that up is, is just to say that, that uh, attachment and in, in sort of uh, uh, ability to connect with uh, whatever is inside of us it's human nature and so given something that as as powerful and, and sort of compelling as you know an artificial intelligence that feels very human um certainly stimulates you know that natural tendency in us to to find connection uh with it and and th this is obviously a, a, a new a new capability that's never existed. And so w we will explore what happens when, when you sort of do this at scale. Okay. So um, I know you listened to the Dennett interview and I, I asked him a similar question. So when I spoke with Luciano Floridi, he spoke about the risks of reontologization. And I, I know that I'm trying to avoid the, the, the philosophical buzzwords, but he basically says that we're moving from a, a physical world into an informational world, you know, which is to say that the best lens to understand our reality now is an informational one. And if you think about it, our digital identities are becoming diffused and they're kind of more important than our physical identities. And what does that mean, you know, for our kind of value and self-worth in this society mm -hmm. yeah uh an, another term that i think uh relates to this is metaverse um yeah you know i think general generally when when you say the word metaverse people tend to imagine like you know 3d vr type worlds but but i submit that that's actually not the sort of interesting part of metaverse i believe metaverse is what we've been living in since really i think since uh 
the beginnings of Facebook, where we started using real names on social media and where the, our digital identities started to have real sort of value or, or be detrimental potentially to mm -hmm. our, our you know, place in society. And, and so I, I believe we sort of live in the metaverse now where I, it is clear uh, that for many of us, including myself, uh, <clears throat> our digital identities are extraordinarily important and for some people more important than sort of the, the real world. Um, and uh, and it, obviously AI takes us even deeper in, into that kind of a world. Do you think that Facebook has been a force for good? I, I think it's uh, it's been, on one hand, a uh, uh, an incredible force for good of allowing people to communicate with other people that they would have lost touch with, to rediscover people that they had lost touch with, and, and again, sort of maintain relationships over time the ability to better understand people and communicate with sort of the abstraction layer of digital and, and be able to bring up subjects that might be uh, too tender to bring up in, in physical world, but behind the screen, it's easier. But that same thing obviously has caused a tremendous amount of, of harm because as soon as you start to allow people to uh, uh, do that same thing that I was just talking about, to sort of use the, the uh, abstraction of digital to be able to, to bring up tender things they can get out of hand. And, and you know, all of the algorithmic issues uh, that happen when you optimize, because Facebook is a business, you no know, matter, where you optimize for engagement and, and you know, advertising dollars, uh, these algorithms start to... Um, incentivized behavior and uh that that's not uh beneficial to to people and uh you know forget sort of the cambridge analytica hack that really impacted the u.s elections so uh it it's everything is yin and yang i think you know to have the good you you have to have the bad and and i think facebook is a great demonstration of that on in certain dimensions it's marvelous in other dimensions it's it's horrible yeah, I was watching the Senate meeting with uh, Gary Marcus and Sam Altman, and a lot of the senators were using the, the Facebook um, sound bites when they were interviewing Sam Altman, and they didn't realize that it's a completely different business model, that they're, they're not trying to um, maximize growth and engagement and attention, and um, it's it's not a social media company in, in any way. And similarly, you're not a social media company. There's There's no centralizing pressures. If anything, you're trying to, even though Facebook say they're trying to do this, you're trying to genuinely maximize uh, ma maximize the individual's capability for self improvement and exploration. Definitely, yeah. Look, Facebook relies on people sharing, you know, creating content of people sharing things, and then obviously relies on people spending as much time as possible engaging with the feed and, and to be able to to show ads and. Uh, when when you've got when you've got that kind of sort of optimization going, uh, it, it makes sense that you'd find some dynamics that are uh, not beneficial to individual users. And 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 okay. AI is okay. radically different than that. What do you think are the ethical risks of digitizing your mind in general? Um, well, there are certainly the um, sort of obvious privacy and uh, and sort of security risks of of digitizing mind uh not sure i'd call those ethical those are sort of just sort of practical uh risks um i i think you know we were talking earlier <clears throat> this when you give humans new capabilities to engage with each other facebook is an example of that um it's hard to predict, you know, sort of <laughs> what what happens in, in, in those cases when you dramatically sort of raise the resolution of humans being able to understand themselves, understand other people, 
discover other people like them. We didn't really touch upon that, but when things are digitized, even though today no one knows that other people are digitizing their minds, one of the things um, that uh, will allow them to do sometime in the near future is voluntarily say, no, I would like to sort of be part of this corpus of users that know that other users exist and be able to connect with one another. So in a sense, sort of dial in other people like yourself or different than yourself in these various dimensions. There's obviously some privacy things there that will need to be considered and pseudonymity and things like that that sort of make people feel comfortable in being able to do that and 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 sort of uh, you know, not, not disclose personal information about themselves that sort of could get out of hand. But this ability to find other people like yourself or different uh, is, is really, really powerful. And uh, when you start to do that, you might allow people to discover their soulmates and discover, you know, their future best friend or discover their future co-conspirators in the next insurrection. And, and yeah. so I, I think that there are many potential... Um, you know, ethical challenges and, and, and learnings, obviously, that, that will happen as we all walk bravely into this new world. I mean, one of the um, the angles I was thinking about is, uh, I mean, for example, when we last interviewed Noam Chomsky, the recording messed up, so we had to deep fake him. And it was surprisingly simple to do. And even after Chomsky dies, um, I could easily create an avatar of Chomsky and I could use GPT to generate a bunch of stuff. I could, we already did clone his voice. I can clone his voice again. And then in some sense, a, a virtual mind can be seen as a form of immortality, you know, to kind of uh, preserve yourself after you die. But I guess the ethical risk there would be, well, what about preserving your legacy? <clears throat> are, they, are they sort of counter to one another? I don't know, because a lot of this is about the diffusion of personal identity in general. So now it's infinitely fractionated in space and time in the physical substrate and in the informational substrate. And something that's very important to our well-being is being in control of our narrative and our kind of footprint of identity, because the more diffused it is, the less control we have over it. <laughs> yeah, so... Uh... I think digital immortality, uh, you know, Ray Kurzweil, for example, is is one that's been sort of working on on wanting to to have this this kind of capability, sort of to capture uh, your own uh, states of mind and, and and be able to sort of either exist in the digital realm beyond death or sort of less uh, provocative, potentially, sort of to to leave this interactive artifact for other people to be able to then sort of engage and, 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 and interact with you. Um, I think the, the again, I, I hesitate to sort of predict the implications of how that's gonna impact, uh, you know, what sort of would be seen as sort of uh, the delta between legacy before this or after this. Um, and I, th I suspect it's going to be sort of a really sort of a, a personal, you know, person by person um, set of pros and cons that, that they will discover in, in those types of situations. Um, I uh, can speak for myself that uh, I'm not looking for digital immortality. Uh, I, I, I think that uh, uh, Death is as positive a an event as as birth, and and the cycle goes round and round. Uh, but I think there are people whose lives will be, you know, made better. I mean, they will feel better about uh, death if they uh, feel like they've been able to sort of capture life in this digital um, model and, and uh, exist beyond their, their years. Yeah, it, it reminds me of a thought experiment by Parfit. Um, he imagined a kind of teleportation system where you could replicate yourself and, you know, there you are on Mars and you destroy the original. And it's all about this question of, um, is there any difference? If, if your mind can be recreated electronically and there's psychological continuity, 
and you're now on Mars, then you've effectively teleported yourself as long as you destroy the original immediately. If you let the original diverge, even for a second, then it may as well be a new person and it has moral status and, and, and all the rest of it. But yeah, there is, there is this notion, though, of to what extent is there a difference between the human mind and, and a perfect replica? I mean, do, do you think it's exactly the same? Uh, no. Uh, I, again, all, all of this is obviously uh, philosophy and, and metaphysics and, and spirituality yeah. and like <laughs> many things that, that, that collide here. Um, my sort of personal uh, state of being, I'll call it, is um, I, I believe that, that uh, consciousness is not something that human beings possess, but that sort of consciousness is something that exists and human beings channel it. And mm. uh, we are expressions of consciousness and we have different names and different hairstyles, but at the end of the day, uh, you know, we are uh, like radios that are broadcasting radio signals. And, and consciousness is the radio signal and each one of us is a radio and tuned into a different dimension of consciousness. Again, all of these are <laughs> words are crude. Uh, and, and so huh? in that kind of a model, then uh, sort of a, I'm an analog radio and this digital model is a digital radio. And just like I can get the signal and articulate it, consciousness, so should a digital um, model be able to do that as well. And is that the same consciousness or different consciousness? Um, depends on where you choose to draw the lines, right? Uh, and, and analog audio is different than the digital audio because digital audio has a lot more resolution. And, uh, uh, you know, on some dimensions and on other dimensions, you, you know, analog has... Uh, you know, some depth that might be compressed in, in digital. And so it's like, where do you draw the lines of like, which one is real and which one is, is not? Yeah, very interesting. So a kind of cosmic consciousness that you tune into. But just to ask a clarifying question, is that like panpsychism, where you, you're still a physicalist, you still think it's a property of the physical world, it's just certain arrangements of physical matter have more or less consciousness? Or do you think there's some other world where consciousness originates from? I think the physical world is a an illusion that consciousness uh, has. And, um, you know, we look outside and we say, we see a, a tree, but is it really a tree that we see there? Or we've First of all, we've learned to recognize this pattern and isolate it from the environment and say, this thing matters and somehow it's not continuous with the physical world, when indeed it, it is all continuous in the physical world. The tree, you know, needs uh, uh, soil. And so is a tree different from soil or is a tree part of soil? And it all comes from the earth. And, and so, again, I think as soon as you start to get into the, the world of of being able to say that consciousness is separate from the physical world. Uh, I'm not sure that that's the, uh, that, that's obviously a common sort of Western thought approach is that humans are made and, and sort of show up in the world somehow through either, you know, evolution or, or divine uh, intervention. And, and, uh, and, and we're sort of in this world and the world is separate from us rather than we are sort of part of the world and as a same part of the world as a tree is part of the world or as a rock is part of the world. We all come out of this world, sort of poke out of it, like fingers poke out of a glove. And is that a finger or is that the glove fingering? I'm a big fan of a philosopher named Alan Watts. Oh, yes. Yeah. Who was an Englishman. Uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, Alan Watts, uh, I think, is the best sort of uh, articulator of my sort of state of mind metaphysics. The, the, yeah. There is just, call it consciousness, call it the world, call it self, call it whatever you want to call it, and that's what there is. And we are all instances of it. 
uh, not separate from it in any way, shape, or form. I'm as continuous with the tree as I am with my hand. And it's only this isolation that our, our mind uh, sort of projects in order for us to be able to operate and speak of things and, and do things like that. Yeah, I, I, um, I'm I familiar with Alan Watts. I've not watched any of his videos in many years, but he's got a, a beautiful voice and mm -hmm. he's a great orator. And um, I think a lot of this um, points to the, the, the self as an illusion. And actually, we anthropomorphize absolutely everything. The way we think about everything, the way we conceive even of intelligence is very anthropocentric. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm really interested in, in a lot of that. But, you know, for final uh, question on, on philosophy. Um, do you think that, as minds become digitized, it could actually, you know, we were talking about the digital divide before with Facebook. So now if you're in the older generation, I guess it's, it's less true now because a lot of old people do use Facebook. But if you're not on Facebook, you're not really, you don't exist anymore. And there might be a new form of digital inequality in a sense where if you don't have access to these virtual agents, you, you might not be able to get a job. I, I believe that this is um, certainly going to be uh, the case. Uh, I believe that uh, as, you know, groups of people choose to sort of merge with information technology and, and sort of be, be able to leverage it radically uh, more effectively than people who have not sort of merged with it and who are still, you know, back to the example of like typing in prompts into chat GPT, with their thumbs versus that now they've got this data set that's sort of in, in parallel able to use all of these different dimensions of these models <clears throat> or have an agent that they've trained that can, um, as their proxy at wire speed with, you know, sort of parallel threads, be, be able to orchestrate the digital world. I, I don't see how it's possible for, uh, the people that choose not to do that to be able to compete in the in the world they might be able to live a a, a good life and 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 you know potentially not use technology at all even there are certainly people that do that i have friends that still have feature phones and and uh you know they they take texts and and other than that like that's the only sort of digital that they use they stay away from it and they they're proud of it and and they think that uh that they you know, in some ways are more human than we are. We're sort of like cyborgs that have already plugged into, you know, this generation of technology. Now we're about to go way, way beyond that. Um, but at the same time, like those people couldn't possibly compete in the modern sort of world of whatever business, let's say, uh, if, uh, if they're not able to to leverage these tools. So I, I think we are about to experience sort of a much greater uh, potential inequality. Uh, but at the same time, I guess the thing that we're proposing is not all of us can learn to be software developers. I mean, can, are willing to dedicate the time, have some aptitude, whatever it is. Right? But let's say that, you know, for, crudely speaking, not all of us can learn to be software developers or prompt engineers or whatever. Um, but you know, if our approach is right, which is all we have to do is to be open with our AI to, to engage and digitize our mind, we don't have to be. The, we do the things that are human, which is be able to communicate with, with uh, you know, an entity. And then it can do all of that sort of work for us. And that becomes sort of an equalizer because everyone has access to that. Yeah, I can see it both ways. It's very plausible that it could be an equalizer. And I also see how it might not be some of the critics of transhumanism in particular. They, they talk about this potential um, kind of fractionation and divergence of different elements of society. And it sounds like science fiction when you talk about people plugging in neural implants and stuff like that. But when you think about this reontologization in the way that Fluidi talks about, you know, in terms of a digital divide and needing to use technology and, and um, increasingly technology on top of technology on top of technology. If you imagine, you know, like if, if a child grows up in the forest and doesn't acquire language, then they're almost like an animal. They can't survive in modern society. And similarly, if you took someone from the 1930s and placed them into today's world of language models and virtual reality, um, it would be like a fish out of water all over again. So I can kind of see the potential for things to either 
become more unequal or, or potentially be democratized? I don't really know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think it depends on what's required of the human uh, sort of time, mental capacity, and and uh, you know, whatever various other sort of dimensions uh, to to be able to do that. Humans are quite diverse in in their abilities to you know pattern match. Uh, grok concepts, learn, etc. So today we have a lot of inequality when it comes to that. Uh, but if if we can sort of outsource uh, a, a lot of that to uh, technology, and we humans simply again e exist and allow the technology to find our weaknesses and sort of augment them, become a digital prosthetic for those of us that could use a digital prosthetic. And for others who don't need a prosthetic, for the technology to discover our deficiencies and then be able to create the learnings we need in order to be able to level up, I guess I, I, I would fall on the, on the side of optimism that, that this can help us dramatically in, in sort of equalizing the world rather than what, what we have today. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Yeah, I, I think the, crit, the, the, the critics say that we shouldn't think of deficiencies as being deficiencies. We should think of them as being part of the human condition. But mm -hmm. it's it's a fascinating um, uh, philosophical thing. J just in in closing, so this is this is really really cool. So you guys are building this startup, and we are going to do a Discord community hangout um, on the MLST Discord where folks can uh, get involved and ask a bunch of questions. Because um, Dimitri, you're, you're trying to get a whole bunch of people in the community together to think about how to develop these prompt templates and, and where you're going to go with the product. So can you talk to that a little bit? Yeah, look, we are, um, we're a small team uh, that have built sort of the infrastructure to allow humans to show up and play around with all of these ideas that we've been speaking about. And, and so th they can go to our website, uai.ai, uh, y-o-u-a-i.ai, uh, -A -A sign up for a free account, join our Discord. And um, what you can do now is you can, one, start digitizing your mind, and uh, as you started to do and sort of play around with some of these prompts, uh, it, it, there's about 1,500 prompts in the system now. Soon there'll be many more. Again, all those prompts today are created by uh, humans. Primarily, they've been created by our team. But we are opening up the platform to allow any user to create sort of a la carte prompts, or more importantly, to create these collections of prompts in whatever area they'd like to enumerate, um, you know, collection of signal. For And so if you're interested in whatever travel, you can come in and create collections of prompts that have to do with teasing out of human minds and, and disambiguating and sort of depending on what level of detail you want to disambiguate to, um, uh, uh, creating these collections for, for people to, to engage with. Um, and, uh, and, and of course, the, the other thing you get for that is you the people that, that engage with those collections sort of tease out the signal that can then be used uh, to contextualize conversations with ChatGPT and, and soon uh, Claude. Uh, and, and as we move forward, um, you know, we're expecting that the community will be instrumental in discovery, sort of in research uh, uh, about this, because we are all human and we all have a mind and all of our minds are different. And we think this diversity of, of you know, different humans sort of uh, creating, uh, you know, the, the system itself, you know, which really just prompts in a sense, uh, is going to be key. Uh, again, eventually, all of this is going to be a data set that can be used to train a model that will do auto prompting. And, um, and, and so over time, I think uh, a lot of it, if not all of it, is going to be driven by by the machine prompting rather than humans prompting. But today, it's all humans that are that are doing the work and 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 the research in a sense. 
Yeah, and I guess all the more reason to have an open-ended, diverse process because we need as much entropy as possible. Um, we need many, many different people, you know, with different backgrounds contributing to this process. So that's absolutely brilliant. So please um, do get involved in that, folks. I'll be publishing it on the MLST Discord after this goes out, and probably in the next week or so, we'll we'll do that meetup session together. And um, yeah, just uh, finally, Dimitri, what, what's what's on the roadmap for you over the, over the next few months? Um, so, uh, as we're recording this, we have not yet launched these two applications that I mentioned earlier. Uh, I think one is going to be called context. This is the fill out the prompts and talk to large language models. Uh, second one's going to be called insights. Same thing. Humans can create these collections of prompts. Other humans can answer them and, you know, we will implement some insights that can, and again, those will evolve over time initially, you know, they might be quite crude, but you'll be able to sort of uh, look at groups of people and, and see where there might be, you know, sort of anomalies and where there's alignment, where there's misalignment. Uh, beyond that, I'm guessing about a month uh, from now, we will be launching a people matching application that will allow you to choose to overlay your mental model uh, with another person. And then, and eventually, potentially multiple people, uh, and sort of choose the level of privacy of that that you sort of want to, how deeply you want them to to instantly see and and, and compare themselves to you. Um, yeah, those are really the things that that are in the near term, and and again, as we sort of move forward, uh, you know, we go down that path to uh, sort of an intelligent personal assistant. But to us, that sort of comes later. Right now, it's it's sort of about being able to. Um, understand yourself, understand other people, and leverage all of this understanding to drive um, you know, productivity and sort of capabilities in dealing with, uh, with AI, AI models of today. Fabulous. Well, so that, that was a call to action, folks. Please get involved in our community session so we can help Dimitri um, you know, test and build out the next iterations of, of his products. But Dimitri, it's been an absolute honor. Thank you so much for joining us today. Really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks so much.